I'd like to start with something that you'd probably rather forget, um, but the fact that you've been exposed to someone who wore blackface on what we know of three occasions, most recently in 2001 when you were 29 years old and a teacher. It is the biggest hit your campaign has taken so far. It's all down to you. It was you doing that, putting mm -hmm. that makeup on. What has that done to your campaign and what does it say about your judgment? I think uh, it's something that I've recognized was a terrible mistake. I should have known better at the time, uh, but I didn't. And I'm, uh, I, I'm going to have to work uh, uh, a long time to continue to demonstrate the kind of focus I've had on fighting racism, fighting discrimination, fighting intolerance as I've worked on as a politician. You know, your critics say it makes you a hypocrite, that you set high standards for other people, but you don't live up to them yourself. Well, I certainly set high standards for myself as well, and I hurt a lot of people I care about deeply. It was a terrible mistake, and I take full responsibility for it. Uh, I apply those high standards to myself. I will always fight against racism, intolerance, and discrimination, and I hurt a lot of people who, who considered me an ally. You know, people have been fired for doing this, certainly lost their reputations for it. You've asked for forgiveness, but why should Canadians give you a pass? Because you're leader of a party? I am someone who has demonstrated throughout my political career, and indeed as Prime Minister, that fighting anti-black racism, fighting systemic discrimination, fighting unconscious bias, and putting real money and real initiatives, and working hard to fight uh, all this intolerance uh, is something that I'm, I've done and I'm going to continue to do and I'm going to continue to do even more uh, given that uh, I have uh, obviously not lived up to that in the past. When did you stop thinking that darkening your skin was acceptable? Was it something, did someone tell you, hey, you know, this is crazy, you're, you're covering not only your face, your throat, your hands, I think in the video even your legs? Did someone say to you, Justin, you got to give this up? As, as I've spoken about, I uh, represent one of the most diverse multicultural ridings in the country. And the work I've done uh, in you know, the late uh, 20, well, 2008, 2009, to be a better representative, a good representative for people by spending time in mosques and gurdwaras and with the Haitian community and all the diverse communities in my writing and fighting for them led me to understand to a much greater degree the kind of discrimination and uh, intolerance that people face on a daily basis because of the color of their skin and that's uh, where, why I understand now, which I should have understood then, that it is always unacceptable. So it was when you got into politics? Well, I think uh, the years uh, following my father's death involved a lot of changes for me. I went back to Montreal in 2002. Uh, I uh, went back to school, studied engineering, studied environmental geography. I got involved more with Katimovic, Canada's National Youth Service Program. I did more environmental and youth activism. I was uh, learning a lot more about public engagement, a lot more about uh, service. And uh, obviously, I am a very different person today than I was back then. So 2001 was the last time? Yes. Um, have you talked to your mother about this? Um, yes, I've talked to my mother, I've talked to my kids, I've talked to friends. What did your uh, mom friends. say? My mom, uh, my mom is someone who uh, has lived through very difficult times uh, in the public eye, some of it possibly deserved, uh, some of it not. Um, she reminded me to stay focused on uh, both the people I've hurt and how I'm going to do better in the future. Was she disappointed in you? I think everyone, a lot of people who know me, uh, were disappointed in me. You disappointed in yourself? Sure, of course. I, I hurt people who I care about deeply and who trusted me. Uh, and that is something that I, uh, I need to understand, but also something that I'm going to need to work for the rest of uh, my life to do better. You know, lots of people are making fun of you. Comedians, late night talk show hosts. You become the butt of jokes. Do you think you've embarrassed Canada on the world stage? I, I think uh, we, we've seen a, a um, 
social media world and indeed an entertainment world that has uh, you know, chosen to poke fun at me for many things in the past. Uh, I think at the same time a lot of people know that the things we're doing as a government and the things that we've achieved and what we stand for uh, also matters and you know people will do what they do I'm going to stay focused on serving Canadians in the right way. This made headlines around the world that other stuff doesn't this did. Well there have been other times that there have been headlines around the world for, so for you don't, my behavior. You don't think this was stands out as a particularly I, I think Absolutely this does. Absolutely this does and it forces me and us to continue to do even more to fight discrimination and racism. It's certainly something that I'm going to do. Are there any other skeletons in the closet, things that you've done in your past that you're not proud of, that you've disclosed to your staff? We've all made mistakes in the past, but my focus has been on, certainly uh, over the past years, on serving Canada to uh, the best of my ability and making the kinds of decisions that have led Canada to do extremely well over these past four years, whether it's job creation or lifting people out of poverty or fighting against discrimination and tolerance. We, we see a time in the world where there is a lot of cynicism and skepticism around politics, around politicians, around their institutions and there are always going to be things people can point to to become more cynical and skeptical. My focus has been on trying to demonstrate that we can do things and we are doing things that make a real difference in people's lives. I asked you if there are any more skeletons in the closet that you've disclo disclosed to your staff. I think we've all done things that we are unhappy with uh, and things that we learn from and I'm no different than anybody else. So there could be other things. I'm, it, there I'm could no be other different occasions. than anyone. People know I'm not perfect, but uh, people also know what I stand for. Let's talk about climate, which is top of mind for a lot of Canadians in this campaign and they, in the world we're living in now. Um, you announced a plan to push Canada to net zero emissions by 2050. That sounds like a bold plan. Uh, what specifically are you going to do? What measures are you going to take to do that? Uh, we, uh, first of all, are going to be meeting our 2030 targets uh, on track as we've committed to, but we need to do much more. That's why uh, part of what we're doing is bringing in uh, panels of experts who will determine the intermediary targets that will be legislated every five years in order to meet them. So the just let me that. stop you on that. Legislated yes. every five. So legally binding targets yes. that what companies and provinces will have to we're meet? We're going to be talking with experts. We're going to be talking uh, with uh, you know, the, the kinds of people who know what it's going to take to do it based on what we've already done. So we you have haven't talked to those experts we've yet. We've demonstrated but an ability to? to bend the curve. We've it, it dimin demonstrated that we can reduce emissions because we are going to be meeting those 2030 targets. And you the way haven't we did met that, the 2030 targets yet. Well, no, because we're not in 2030 years. yet, right? But, but you're not so on track. We are on track. We are absolutely on track. Canada remains one of the biggest emitters per capita in the world. Hmm? Emissions have been going up and in this country. And we are on track to Under your eliminate uh, all uh, to re meet, meet our uh, emissions reduction targets by 2030. And the way we've done that is by putting a price on pollution, is by moving forward on uh, protecting uh, our oceans, in moving forward on banning single-use plastics, on uh, changing behaviors, on investing in, uh, in renewables. We have demonstrated real action on this, and I agree we have more to do. But the choice Canadians are facing right now is between a government that has done lots and will do lots more or a conservative government that has never done anything to fight climate change and is not serious about it and doesn't even understand that fighting climate change is not just an environmental imperative, it's an economic imperative. And that choice that people are facing right now, I mean, I, I give you credit for saying, yes, we need to do more, absolutely. The conservatives are the ones who think we need to do less. So we're gonna talk separately to the conservative leader, but I wanna ask you about mm -hmm. your policies and mm -hmm. your plans. The national carbon tax has, has essentially fallen apart. You have not been successful in putting that in we place. We actually have put that in place. The pan-Canadian framework the pan -Canadian is pretty well dissolves. How, how, how do you say it's dissolved? There, it's, not a, it's not a national carbon tax. 
It hasn't but, been so, has it been as successful as you would like it to Yes, it has, and it is in place in every province across the country. The Pan-Canadian Framework on Climate Change is in place, and that's, that's a good place to start, because if people aren't clear on that, we have brought in a price on pollution right across the country. And yes, there are Conservative Premiers who are fighting against it uh, in provinces from, from the Rockies to the Bay of Fundy, because they don't think we should be moving off. They're, they're, they're spending millions in court of taxpayer money to try and fight that pollution pricing, but we are winning. And that price on pollution is in place right across the country. Now, yes, Andrew Scheer says he will make pollution free again if he gets uh, elected, but we moved forward on that, and I'm glad to correct people on that. We, ha we have a price on pollution right across the country right now, one that returns more money uh, in the provinces that refuse to do it than they actually pay out. Getting back to your plan that was announced today, uh, what will you do to companies who can't meet these targets or won't meet these targets or the legally binding no, the, targets? The, the plan we announced today features uh, cutting in half corporate taxes on big and in small co companies that are developing zero emission technologies because so we know there is trillions of dollars in opportunity around the world for zero emission technologies and now Canada is going to be able to be a leader in generating And then how those. much money would that generate that well, what we can imagine the, the, the companies that set up shop in Canada because they are paying less taxes than anywhere else in the world to make those initiatives were already been, been judged to be one of the easiest com uh, countries to set up uh, environmentally clean and uh, cutting edge clean tech businesses. Uh, we're continuing to create that advantage so we create jobs and growth and economic opportunity uh, on solutions that the world is going to need. That's a, a tangible thing where we create solutions that work for Canada and uh, work for the world as well, in contrast with others who don't think we should be doing anything on the environment. So I think people are hungry for details on how you're going to do that. When would we know that? When would Canadians <laughs> I am that? very excited about this coming week where we will be uh, laying out more pillars of our environmental plan, where we will demonstrate that we are serious about tackling climate change and uh, really emphasize that choice that Canadians are facing between Conservatives who don't believe in acting on climate change and don't understand that it's not just the environment, but it's our economy that is at stake. Did you hear Greta Thunberg at the UN, her address? Did you find it, um, how did you find it? Was it unnerving for you as a world it, leader? Was it unsettling? I found it incredibly compelling and challenging and really important. Uh, even with everything we've done and everything Canadians and particularly young Canadians, because Greta is not the only one, we've seen you know, millions of young people marching around the world and young Canadians telling me every day we need to do more. But even with all those voices, we still have conservative politicians at the provincial level fighting any action on climate change. And this election is pivotal for young people and for all Canadians onto whether we make a choice to continue and do more on fighting climate change or else we stick our heads in the sand and try and hide from the changes that are going to be challenging our kids. Another issue that's top of mind for Canadians is health care. Mm. And you announced uh, some plans yesterday to help Canadians find a family doctor. Um, thousands of Canadians, as you know, don't have a family doctor. My aging parents didn't have one when they died. I didn't have one when I moved here from the UK. It took years to find one. This is an issue that's really affecting the daily life of so many Canadians. How are you going to make that happen? The same way we moved forward uh, when we signed the previous group of health accords with the provinces just a couple of years ago uh, in investing in greater home care and in investing uh, in greater mental health care. Uh, we sit down with the provinces, we set clear targets, uh, we uh, invest more federal money in provinces so they can deliver on these targets of delivering more health care uh, more healthcare practitioners to communities, particularly remote and northern communities that need them. And yes, it requires partnership with the provinces, an ability we demonstrated when we renegotiated the health accords with all 10 provinces and three territories a few years ago. We're going to need to move forward. Obviously, there's going to be negotiation with the provinces. And the question for Canadians is, who do they want negotiating with, Andrew, uh, with, uh, with Doug Ford and Jason Kenney? And that choice is very clear when you see what Kenney is doing, what Ford is doing, and what Shear is proposing to do. So are you promising more family doctors? 
Yes, we're pro we are making a commitment that the federal money invested uh, in health care is going to help more Canadians get or help Canadians get family doctors. Yes. So I think that that's another one where people want detail. I don't get how that's going to work. Well, that is in negotiation with the provinces. That is the federal money, the federal government putting six billion dollars forward as a down payment on helping the provinces reach targets to make sure that people can have access to, to family doctors and nurse practitioners and the kind of health care supports they need. You're promising a national pharmacare plan too. Mm -hmm. um, when will that be in place and how much would that cost? Well, we recognize that, again, pharmacare is something we need to work on with the provinces. There are some things that a federal government can do. and We've already put in place things that will uh, reduce by $13 billion over the next 10 years costs of prescription drugs for Canadians. And it's so effective the drug companies are taking us to court on that. Um, we're uh, moving forward on creating a pan-Canadian uh, Canadian drug agency uh, that is going to be establishing a formulary. And we're actually also also, tangibly moving forward on high-cost drugs for rare diseases, which we know is an incredible challenge for families facing uh, particular rare diseases. So we've done concrete things that move towards that. The next steps is to work with the provinces to implement uh, their recommendations in the expert panel on, on Pharmacare, and that is what we're there to do. Yesterday you talked about a $6 billion down payment mm -hmm. to make this happen. What's the real cost of this, though? There have been others who have costed it, uh, estimated perhaps $15 billion a year. Well, why, why don't you just be clear with Canadians? We want to do this for you. This is what it's going to cost. And here's how we're going to pay for it. Because we're not the only ones who have a say in doing it. The provinces also have a responsibility uh, to uh, express what they want. And many provinces already have systems that are partially there. As we work together to figure out what the national framework will look like, that will become clearer. But like we did in the 2015 election where we committed uh, $3 billion uh, over four years and ended up signing uh, health accords that actually invested even more money than that uh, over the 10 years phrase uh, frame, um, these are conversations that we need to have. But the question, of course, for Canadians is, do they want to double down on conservative leadership when it comes to their, uh, their health care? Every single answer you give me comes back to that. It's but almost that's as the if choice. you so but you want to set choice yourself Canadians up are facing. as you know. I, I'm not going to give you a lot of detail in terms of numbers of what I'm going to cut or how much things are going to cost. But I'm going to say, trust me. Don't trust that guy. Is your, that your, what this is? Your very is? first question to me today, as we were walking, was about what's the difference between running with a record now and running in 2015. Well, what I can say now is, look at what we've done. Look at what we've been able to do. Look at how we delivered on those promises uh, to Canadians from the 2015 election of investing five and a half billion dollars in health care, uh, in, in home care, and another five billion dollars uh, in mental health. Look at what we've done on actually reducing drug prices for Canadians. Look at the help that we've given to families with the Canada Child Benefit, uh, with lower taxes for the middle class and raising them on the wealthiest one percent. Yes, there is an advantage of having a record to run on because we can say that we did these things and we're going to be able to do the next things as well. That's what re-election uh, is about and that's where looking at Canadians and saying we've got lots more to do and we have a vision and a plan to do that and the others, well, they are putting forward, well, the Conservatives are putting forward the exact same approach that, the, that, that Stephen Harper did. I mean, when they cut taxes, they cut taxes for the wealthy. That's what you see in every little piece of their plan that Stephen they put Harper's forward. Stephen Harper's not running in this campaign. But his plan form, you ask Andrew Scheer uh, where he differs from Stephen Harper, and he will not answer you okay. because so, he well, is exactly the same frame of tax breaks to the wealthy in the hopes of creating growth. So with respect, let's talk about you. Sure. And not, not the past Conservatives government. But it's still the choice. For four years ago, your campaign was about sunny ways. Mm -hmm. You promised Canadians you would do politics differently. In the four years you've been, office, you've been in office, you were found guilty twice of ethics violations. What have you learned from that? Oh, that uh, we continue to have more to do uh, to demonstrate uh, the kinds of transparency we are you. that Canadians. Uh, we you as keep a government. Talking we, but these ethics we as a violations were were you. 
Oh, sure. Uh, well, let's, let's talk about that one where I was sticking up for Canadian jobs and trying to move forward in balancing, in respecting our judiciary while at the same time protecting Canadian jobs. And uh, even before the Commissioner's report came out, uh, I had asked an expert panel, include, in, headed up by Anne McClellan, to talk to all our former AGs to figure out how we can make sure that governments in the future never get into that situation of uh, having to you know, balance these impossible things without a roadmap to do it. I understand that, but the Ethics Commissioner said you pushed too far I, for partisan reasons. I accept the Ethics Commissioner's report, but I disagreed with his conclusions. But I fully accept his report and therefore will move forward in measures to make sure that no uh, future government has that, has that conflict. But I will not apologize for standing up for Canadian jobs because that is what Canadians expect me to do, to fight for the public interest. You lost two female cabinet ministers who were prominent and uh, star members of your cabinet, very well respected, because they said they lost faith in, faith in you. What did you learn from that? Um, that's, uh, that is a question for, for, for them as to why they left. Uh, no, when they I left you, it, when mm -hmm. they, they are no longer part of your cabinet, mm -hmm. I know you can argue about they were kicked out or not. You, you, that, that relationship was severed, mm -hmm. and they said they lost faith in you as mm -hmm. a leader. What did you learn from that? Was there any soul searching? Oh, there absolutely was. And we already brought in uh, ways of uh, connecting and communicating and dealing earlier on with people who have concerns. Uh, there was, uh, there is a need to keep a, a better flow of communications within an organization. And that's one of the things that we've learned from. Um, getting back to the last campaign compared to this one, you promised a lot of things then, and some of them you've delivered on, some of them you've not. Uh, the first one, electoral reform, um, balancing the budget, um, meeting climate targets. I know you argue that you're on course. Others say that we're not where we should be. We are, we are uh, going to doing, meet our climate targets. Doing politics differently, mm -hmm. and you've been, as I said, to ethics violations. Why should Canadians trust you now? Because we made a commitment to Canadians to grow the middle class and help people working hard to join it. And we've delivered on that. We've seen Canadians But what's different Canadians about the create... leader you are today compared mm -hmm. to the leader you were four well, years ago? Every single day in this job, I learn more. I learn better ways to do things. I uh, grow in my capacity to serve Canadians. And that is something that, uh, that I feel every single day in our ability to do even more. And that's reflected in the ambitious platform we're putting forward with a vision for the next four years that is going to continue to take us in that right direction and that's that's the choice people are, are facing do we continue to move forward or do we go back so I think at the ballot box for a lot of people it comes down to when uh, the two candidate two front runners are neck and neck although the polls today are suggesting you're falling behind a little bit that it's, it comes down to who do we trust to run this country that's a think, fundamental question about who you are as a leader, not mm -hmm. just your policies, mm -hmm. right? No, it's also a question about who has the better vision for the future, who gets where the country is going and has the team and the capacity to deliver on that. And that's why I'm so excited about contrasting, yes, my vision with the vision of the Conservatives that does not have a clear vision for moving this country forward. Whether it's on things like uh, banning assault weapons, they want to weaken gun control, we are going to strengthen gun control. They don't think we need to move forward on, on fighting uh, for a cleaner future and protecting the environment. I know that's the only way to create jobs and a better future for our kids. And when it comes to taxes, we are all about lowering taxes for the middle class and for people working hard to join it. They are actually giving tax breaks to the wealthiest because that's what they've always done as Conservatives. We're running out of time. There's a couple of quick questions I want to get you. Bill C-21, mm -hmm. you have been sitting on the fence about that one, saying let's leave it to Quebec. Critics call it um, legislated discrimination. Can you make it clear to Canadians what you think about that legislation? I, I have made it very clear many times. I disagree with that legislation. I do not think we should be uh, legitimizing discrimination against anyone anywhere in this country. And I've said it to Quebecers, I've said it to all Canadians. But at the same time, I know that the Charter is working the way it needs to. Quebecers have taken that legislation to court and are defending the Charter and we are watching it as it goes, but I am the only federal leader who has not said that I am never, that I'm closing the door to intervening later. Uh, 
this is too important. Uh, this is a matter of fundamental freedoms for people, uh, and I don't think the federal government should close the door on that. Why don't you just say, I will intervene? Uh, because I haven't made that determination yet. I am watching Quebecers defend their charter rights in court. Let me ask you about equalization payments. Premier Kenny has said he wants equalization reform mm -hmm. uh, and that he will call for it no matter who is elected Prime Minister. Are you open to that idea? We uh, renewed the equalization formula as it currently stands based on a year worth of con conversations with the premiers, conversations with the provinces. We renewed a formula that was actually created as it is now by Jason Kenney and the government he was part of. So I think it's playing a lot of politics right now to be so upset about something that he set up for political gain right now. Uh, I am uh, going to continue to, uh, to defend uh, the system we have in place because it works. And quite frankly, if Andrew Scheer disagrees with Jason Kenney or agrees with him, he needs to answer that question as well, because I'm going to continue to stand up for the national interest. So taking the partisan stuff out of it, which is what I'm always trying to do, do you believe that the equalization formula as it stands now is fair yes. to everyone in the country? Yes, that is why we stand, renewed it. And that it'll stand the way it is? It'll stand for the, next, for the rest of the five years that we renegotiated with support from all the provinces um, just, uh, just a, a year or so ago. One final question about uh, opioids. Hmm. Thousands of people are dying across this country, have died and continue to die because of opioid overdoses um, in all walks of life. The Green Party has said they will decriminalize drug possession. Are you open to that idea? Uh, we are moving forward on things that actually work, whether it's safe, safe consumption, uh, safe supply, harm reduction. We have demonstrated that we're moving forward on a uh, evidence-based process which uh, involves fun more funding for frontline workers, uh, more uh, addiction treatments, more supports for communities. There's lots more to do. We have done a lot. We're going to continue to do the things that work. Specifically, are you open to the idea of decriminalizing uh, right now? Right Right now, we're focused on safe consumption and harm reduction. So that's but again, that's another question for the Conservatives of why they want to turn back <laughs> safe consumption and harm reduction. I mean, so, this election I'm, is a choice. Uh, no, asking. we're not. We're not looking at de full decriminalization at all right now. There are other things that we are doing that are having a big impact, uh, and we're going to make decisions based on science. Uh, and again, it goes back to the choice that Canadians are facing. Do we continue to base our decisions on science and saving lives with things like safe consumption, or do we go backwards as the Conservatives are proposing? I have one more question. You're taking a lot of heat for not costing your platform. Oh, our, our platform will be absolutely fully costed when? and we are working with when we release our full platform very shortly. Very shortly. Yes. In the next week? Very shortly. You can't expect Canadians to believe all the promises. Nothing comes for free, right? You need to we, put a price tag We demonstrated on it. in 2015 an incredibly ambitious platform that was fully costed. We're doing exactly that again. And this time we get to work with the PBO because we made a change that ensured that every party could work with the PBO, to make the parliamentary budget officer, to make sure that their platforms are properly costed. All right, well, look for that. Mr. Trudeau, thank you so much. Always a pleasure, thank Donna. You. It's a pleasure. Thank you.